Over 220 FPS in Apex Legends max settings at above 1440p. PC gaming changes today, or at least it does for laptops, because inside this box is the brand new Strix Scar 18, but it's packing an NVIDIA RTX 4090 laptop GPU, which should finally mean max settings across the board, including ray tracing and support for features like DLSS 3.0. So is this really going to be the best thing since sliced bread, or is this a unnecessary case of more power, but more unnecessary cost? Find out absolutely everything you need to know about the new NVIDIA GPUs and the Strix Scar 18 after a short word from this video sponsor. The Gigabyte S55U brings large format bliss to PC gaming. Packing a 55 inch 4K quantum dot display, the S55U is perfect for playing games up to a silky smooth 120 hertz. You get variable refresh rate modes, eARC and auto low latency mode, as well as HDMI 2.1, what is not to love? Learn more today with the link down below. Awesome, let's get started. And I will start actually by apologizing for my voice because yes, I am a little bit cold and fluey. No one is immune, not even a PC gamer like myself who never ventures outside. I don't know where I picked it up. I'm gonna blame the tech chap because I saw him last week. So, Tom, sort it out. But here we have the SCAR 18. And this is of course an 18 inch laptop. They're sort of cheating a little bit in terms of screen size because this actually uses a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, but that's only a good thing because it means you get more screen for the same sort of footprint. Here it is under the overhead camera that's about to die really conveniently, but it's actually not as heavy as I thought. Bearing in mind this is a very big and bulky laptop, it's actually neither particularly big nor bulky, which is quite something. Obviously it's not the thinnest thing in the world, but compared to the really super power RTX laptops of yesteryear, I think we've actually come quite a long way. I mean, I say RTX, that was back in the GTX days when laptop GPUs were actually appropriately named because this is officially called the RTX 4090 laptop GPU, which I find incredibly confusing. What was wrong with calling it M at the end? Because there are people that are gonna assume that you're gonna get the same, or at least very similar performance to a desktop RTX 4090 versus this, but the truth couldn't really be further away. I mean, this will be the best performing laptop at the time of filming. This actually maxes out at a TDP of 175 watts, whereas as we know, on the desktop size you're looking at probably about 400 maybe 450 if you're going to do some overclocking so this thing doesn't really have too much of a chance there but I'm excited to test performance and we will be showing you some benchmarks a little bit later in this video but I've got to admit again going to the overhead camera for a little bit here I actually think this looks pretty darn incredible this honestly is one of the nicest laptops I've ever had in hand I mean the RGB is a little bit over the top I mean can you blame them it's a gaming laptop but I would definitely turn this off to save a little bit of battery life and to make myself look a little bit more grown up not that there's anything wrong with looking and feeling young it's just not my style but I definitely think the thing for me that stands out the most is this absolutely ginormous display I mean, normally with a laptop like this, after a few months, maybe a year or so, you'll probably set it up at home with a like second gaming display and have something that's very big and plug in and use that. But you honestly don't really need to with this because it is that gigantic in the first place. This is actually 1440p. And if you go for the smaller size, confusingly, you can get one that has a mini LED backlight that goes up to, I think, 1,100 nits. Whereas this is still HDR, but only goes up to 500. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit confused why this would be the case. You'd think the larger, more expensive laptop would be the one that has the better display, but I guess it's just a limitation in the panels that are available for ROG to actually install on this. I don't think I would strictly describe this as a deal breaker, but it is definitely something to note if you are after an HDR gaming laptop, I suppose, which if you're spending this sort of money, chances are you probably are. As you'd expect, port selection on this is pretty high end. You've got Ethernet, HDMI 2.1, which is gonna be useful for hooking up to a 4K TV or a 4K monitor. You've got two USB Type-C I'm not sure how many have Thunderbolt because both of them have this little logo. A headphone microphone combo jack and then on the other side you've got two more USB type A's this time. But I am a little bit disappointed to see that there's actually nothing on the back. Personally this is where I prefer to see things like power and USB so you can plug all your adapters in and then it's not sort of going to get in your way. But I understand that this is obviously going to need a very high end cooling system especially for something that is as thin as this for something as in theory, big and beefy. So I guess this is just to give you better cooling. Hopefully it's gonna be very quiet. 
but I have my doubts. Interestingly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, in the desktop when you're using this as a laptop without any AC power, we're running this at a perceived 60 hertz. But this, of course, does go up to 240 with this 1440p panel. Or if you opt for the base model, you can get this in, I think it's 165 hertz at 1080p. Though if you are going for a high-end GPU, that seems like a bit of a waste for me, because you're going to get very CPU bottlenecked. So yes, here we go, 2560 by 1600 resolution. So 16 by 10, 1440p. And when we go into refresh rate, you can see, yes, the default is 60 hertz. But if we navigate over to this little drop down, we can change this to 240. 240 hertz on a laptop having to screenshot all of this because you can't record the desktop with laptops, which is still quite annoying. And when you move that mouse around or the trackpad around, it is super, super slick. It should be noted that this is only a three millisecond panel though. So compared to the very best OLEDs that are like 0.03 over on the desktop side of things at the moment, it's not the best cutting edge tech, especially bear in mind, again, it maxes out at 500 nits, but in terms of color accuracy and things, it looks absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's just under 100% of DCI P3. So if you are a creative professional or you just want your things looking the absolute best, this is one heck of a panel. This is unusual actually. I've gone to enable HDR, but it's not actually in the display settings. We have two different displays, clearly because the Optimus technology is choosing between the two, but we're definitely running on the GPU at the moment, so quite why we can't enable HDR, I'm not sure. But I know, I know, you're not here for creative stuff. You wanna know about gaming, you wanna know whether the RCX 4090 is a gimmick or something that is truly next level. So let's get some games installed and find out. Right, we're back and we've got camera four. And I think we will kick off with the largest RTX title some Cyberpunk 2077. Oh, coil wine. Coil wine from a laptop. I mean, it's only in the menus, it doesn't matter, but interesting that it's there. Let's navigate over to the options menu. Change this to full screen. And graphics, I think we're set to ray tracing ultra. And we'll leave frame gen off for just a second, but we'll set the super resolution to balanced. And here we go, and that is insanely smooth. Around about 80 to 90 FPS in what is quite a busy part of the city. That is impressive, to be honest. Especially bear in mind we're not actually using frame gen yet, so this probably isn't even that realistic. Let's grab one of my motorcycles and go for a little drive, shall we? And interestingly as well, we're not actually seeing any CPU bottlenecking, which I must confess, I did think we would start to see. Maybe we'll want some other games, but this is running the latest 13th generation Intel CPU. I think it's called the 13980. It's part of their H series. It's the top end one anyway, and it's actually 24 cores of which eight of those are the proper full fat performance and then the rest are efficiency cores. So this really is gonna be perfect, regardless whether you're gaming or doing something creative. I'd say this is actually very good performance. Bear in mind, this is gonna be like top end stuff. You're not really gonna see anything that's that much more demanding than this, to be honest. I do think that we've got to the point where I wanted to be, to be honest, with not only gaming PCs, but clearly gaming laptops as well, because last time you could get decent performance out of these things. It's just that the CPUs weren't really good enough to properly give yourself the best frame rate. So there are plenty of games that you would fire up and you're just finding that you were bottlenecked really. And clearly this is also helped by that larger resolution. I mean, this screen is actually beautiful. We're not even running this in HDR mode just yet, but the extra screen real estate really does help. As I sort of alluded to in the intro to this video, I mean, the fact that you've got such a large display, it really does mean that you're not necessarily going to need to buy anything extra on top of this because this is large enough and nice enough to actually use as your main display. I mean, gaming laptops have come a long way in a very short space of time. There it is, DLSS frame generation. And this is a big deal, not only because it can increase our frame rate by adding frames, but because this actually works in CPU bound titles as well. So if you do find yourself in a CPU bound scenario, assuming it does support DLSS 3.0, you can get a fair old boost to your frame rate. But let's have a look. How much difference has this actually made? Well, it's caused an accident, which is never great. Um, but you can see there is a decent increase, actually. We've gone from what? Between 80-ish to 115, 120. So about 35 frames per second more. Still not saturating the 240 hertz display, but in a game like Cyberpunk, with all of the bells and whistles enabled, clearly this does 
a very, very good job. It will increase your latency though. We're currently getting about 55 milliseconds or so, but I think most people will be very happy with this. It's not ultra competitive. This is still relatively low, especially to what you'd be able to achieve on previous gaming laptops. So yes, I would say if you want to play Cyberpunk or anything that NVIDIA want you to play, which is using all of their technologies, clearly Cyberpunk is a brilliant example. But guess what, NVIDIA? Not everyone plays these titles. It's just performing its first time setup on Apex Legends, and I'm gonna take this opportunity while we're waiting to actually show you this power brick, because it is very large. This actually gives you, what is it? About 350 watts, I think? 330 watts of juice through this thing. Absolutely fine for a desk, not so good if you wanna take this around with you all of the time. And sure enough, yes, as we touch down on the floor, you can see we've gone to around about 230, 220 FPS. So we're basically, fully maxing out this display. Don't forget it does also have G-Sync as well, so it is able to activate variable refresh rates, but it is gonna depend on the exact scene because now we have gone outside again, it has dropped down a little bit. Not massively actually, still about 200 or so FPS. So if you are the sort of person that wants a complete no compromise gaming experience, but you want something that is portable, then evidently this is gonna give you a fantastic time. But do pay very close attention to the top left hand corner of your screen where you can now start to see we are actually getting a little bit of CPU bottlenecking. And I think this is another reason that if you were gonna go for the 1080p model of this, then you definitely wouldn't need a particularly high-end GPU because you're much more likely to run into CPU bottlenecking when you have less resolution to play with. I always find it quite tricky talking about these top-end gaming laptops because on one hand, the performance is phenomenal. And while it's never gonna compete with a desktop 4090, there's no doubt about it that this is more performance than anyone really ever needs from a gaming laptop. I mean, yes, if you're a professional, it makes sense, but a lot of people that are buying these are not and they just have money to spend on the best gaming experience that they can. But the problem I have with them is usually noise levels, but that's actually not an issue here. I mean, listen to this. Bear in mind this is using up to 330 watts. You wouldn't really know if you have any noise at all, you're not really gonna hear this, which is definitely not something we say about top-end gaming laptops. But then you still have the problem that you're putting a lot of money into something that's a lot less upgradable than a desktop PC. If you want a new GPU, you wanna swap out the CPU, well, you can't deal on this. Whereas if you buy a brand new Ryzen PC, then chances are that will be upgradable for years and years to come. And obviously Intel, you can swap things out as well, but you often need new motherboards. But still, we get the point. This is uh, more disposable than a desktop PC. Words I didn't think I'd ever really say. But regardless of what you make or the value of this thing or just your opinion on gaming laptops in general, I don't think there is any denying that it is very impressive what you can get from this generation. I mean, if you're after the best gaming laptop, this has got to be in the shortlist, surely. I've just invested 36 pounds on Dead Space for you because you're complaining you don't get all the new games. But I have noticed there is actually a tiny bit of IPS glow at the bottom of this monitor. You can only see it on completely black screens, but if you are gonna watch a movie or something with black bars, it could show up, so do be aware of this. On the whole, not bad, but that bit was noticeable. We've got Nvidia DLSS that we're set to be balanced again, and then graphics, I think we're cranking this up to max. It looks good! Have to admit, you would never know that this was a remake, but I suppose they've made it from the ground up again, more or less. Wow, look at that. That is quite something, isn't it? I've got to admit, I am impressed by this. I might play this tonight, for science. And this is another title look that we are borderline CPU bottlenecked. Clearly the pairing of this top end 4090 with the top end 13th gen CPU are, I guess, trading blows. I'm not sure how this is gonna do for stutter and things like that, if they're always competing, but at least we're not sitting at something like 70% GPU utilization like we have been from past generation laptops. So that in itself is pretty cool. Just obviously make sure you're buying an appropriate CPU for the appropriate GPU that you're gonna be getting. Let's press on though to the game I play the most, F1 22. I am the best gamer. I'm a very clean racer when it comes to this. No one can touch me. As you will see off the start line, this is actually running at the ultra high price preset, which is not how I usually play the game because we've got ray tracing and things enabled, which personally I don't think is really necessary with something like this. I mean, from a visual point of view, that was a terrible corner. Uh, from a visual point of view, obviously it will look better, but something like this, I would argue is multiplayer. So you do want to get the absolute best sort of latency possible, shall we say. But still, it is actually quite impressive how well it handles everything. This is DLSS set to balanced. 
and then with ray tracing we're currently getting about 120 fps or so you can see there's an ever so slight cpu bottleneck here but that is actually caused by the ray tracing don't forget it is very dependent on the cpu as well as the gpu but let's go into the settings and change it to how i would actually want to play it myself so let's keep everything the same but we'll turn the ray tracing off and I expect we'll see a much higher frame rate now of, you can't even see that at the moment, which isn't very helpful because it's blue sky. Yeah, around about 200 FPS, 205. So this is a title that you actually will be able to use that 240 hertz screen to good use, especially if you turn the settings down ever so slightly. But to be honest, when your latency is around about 18, 15 milliseconds or so, I don't really think you need to do that. But it's nice to have the option. And clearly, if you are a serious F1 fan and you want to plug in like a wheel or something, it's quite nice to be able to have the power to do it, but then also the screen size as well. Again, this is a, a pretty cool little screen. So yeah, all things considered, I genuinely love this laptop. This is not something that's meant to appeal to those looking to get the best value possible and for anyone that wants like a RTX GPU at the lowest possible price. This is about having pretty much the best of everything. You've got portability, it's not thin and light, but it's not massively thick either. You don't really have to worry about noise levels or thermals, which is very, very impressive. I think that for a lot of people, that actually be the main takeaway of this. You get something that's very attractive, something that feels premium, something that you'd be proud to own, but something that does also pack a ridiculous amount of performance into this sort of chassis. And again, it's not about value. If you're looking for that, look elsewhere, look lower down the stack, look just to see what is gonna be the best priced performance. But if you do want the best of the best, we haven't tested any of the other laptops from your Alienwares, your Razors, anything like that just yet, but there's not really anything I can fault this laptop for other than HDR in the fact that 500 nits is the peak of this, and if it does support HDR gaming, I can't find a way to turn it on, which is a little bit strange, but I'm sure that will get patched. And I will actually leave a pinned comment below this video when I find more information about that. But I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts about the SCAR 18. Is this the laptop you've been waiting for? Have you been putting off generational upgrades? Are you sick of GPU pricing when you think actually laptops offer decent value for money? Let me know what other laptops you want me to test and what games you want me to play on them. But if you've enjoyed this video, smash the like button. It really helps out. Get yourself subscribed. And as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on the SCAR 18 or maybe some of its comp Competition, you can find my Amazon affiliate links listed down below. And while you're down there, why not check out the Gigabyte S55U? This gaming display is perfect for PCs and next-gen consoles, and it even comes rocking Android OS for entertainment bliss. It supports 96% of the DCI P3 color space, HDR10+, with full array local dimming, has a Chromecast built right in, and rocks apps like Netflix, Prime, and YouTube. Get yours today with a link down below. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I'll catch you in the next one.